Hello and welcome to Ordinary People Doing Extraordinary Things. I am your host, Kerry Roberts, and today I have another special guest. I have Dunal Hernan. He is the VP of Innovation, Strategy, Creativity, and R&D at Nokia Bell Labs. So excited to have you here today, Dunal. Thank you for joining. Hey, great to be here and excellent pronunciation of my very complicated Irish name. <laughs> Yes, I, we, we worked on it before when we had spoken, so I appreciate it. And, you know, I have been following your work for a while, so excited to have you here. We like to kind of go back into this show and talk about kind of the beginning. So you grew up in Ireland, and I'm curious as a young boy, where was your fascination with art and science at the time? Like, were you into music or theater or were you into math and science? Like, where was kind of your interest as a young kid? Yeah, so I kind of have a, a split personality that I can find difficult to reconcile at times. So I grew up in a very musical family. So again, when you, when you it's a bit complicated for me because when you talk about art, art is much broader than just music. But I grew up in a musical family. I played the fiddle, still do, used to play a lot when I was younger. I was exposed to a lot of Irish traditional music, uh, traveled all around Ireland and beyond Ireland when I was much younger. So I had a lot of exposure on the music side of things. And that was a very natural thing for me because of my upbringing and the region I lived in in Ireland, which is very musical. And then separate to that, I had my my schooling and I developed, an, a, well, I had always a very keen interest in space and aeronautics and astronautics and very much into that. But then I used to sit, stand out our backyard in Ireland and all the planes going from Dublin and London to the US would pass over our heads. And I'd look up and see these magical creatures, 40,000 foot in the sky, and kind of just be fascinated by how the hell can this happen? Or how is this possible that this lump of metal can fly? And this is um, one of the things that fascinated me. So I had this dual split personality with a very keen interest in deep engineering science, mainly around aerospace and aeronautics and airplanes. And then separately, I had this very organic, natural, musical thing with my family that I never really think about in an um, analytical way unless someone starts asking me questions in an interview and then I have to start thinking about that side of my life. Yeah, I, um, I'm a dancer and I always, we were talking offline before, I have been to Ireland a few years ago and I'm always impressed because I feel like other cultures generally outside of the United States have art kind of ingrained in their life somehow. I mean, when I was in Ireland, people were just at bars just playing music all the time. I and mean, was that something that like, again, did you take lessons or it was just around you and you just kind of picked it up through your parents and your siblings? It was a bit of both. So I grew up, uh, my father is a professional Irish musician. So mm -hmm. I grew up around music. My mother sings and has, you know, albums and, you know, she sings professionally and my brothers play. So I was certainly around it. The, the region we lived in, the south of Sligo, a little village called Gurchin, is known historically for its music. So, for example, and I, I tell the story kind of joking, but it's serious as well. I lived in a village of maybe 150 people. In that village, in the village itself, there was five pubs. Right. So the, there was a big pub scene, a lot of alcohol consumption, which is very traditional kind of stereotype for Ireland, but it's true. <laughs> but each of those pubs had music. So any night of the week when I was younger growing up, you could go to any one of those different pubs and you'd probably have what's called a session where Irish musicians get together and they just play freely. Um, you know, what you would think of it as jamming and other types of music genres. So that was in my village, in a tiny, tiny village. And I had that access to that kind of music and that history of that music in that region. And then I had it at home with my father and my mother and my brothers. And then I also did lessons as well when I was much earlier, you know, in my early teens, just to kind of formalize some of that uh, learning as well. So I, I had it every which way you could imagine. Oh, I love that. I wish we had more of that in the States as a whole. So another thing that I think is interesting is that in a lot of cultures in different countries, U.S. has their own where, and this is not everybody, but there's a lot of times where there's kind of pressure on high school kids to figure out what they want to do and the pressure to say, you should be a lawyer or a doctor are the two big ones in the US. Um, and so sometimes parents push them. Did you as a kid, like, did you know kind of what you wanted to do? And was there any influence from the Irish culture or from your family of where you should go in your career? 
No, there wasn't. My my father was, you know, very keen on me not being a professional musician because, you know, unless you do extremely well, uh, it's it can be a tricky life. It's a hard life at times. You know, a lot of traveling on the road and playing gigs all over the place. So he was he was kind of I would say, you know, he was supportive of me not becoming a, a professional musician, but he never tried to really in a stern way move me off it. Um, other than that, they were just happy that I seemed to do well at school. I I was extremely lucky at a very young age, and I remember back to maybe being 14, looking up at those airplanes passing over, and I said to myself, I want to go to college and learn how to design airplanes. I had no interest flying them at that age. I still don't. It doesn't do anything for me. But I had this fascination with being able to design them and design new types of airplanes that would do exactly this magical thing that I could see in the sky above me. So. I knew very early on the subjects to do in school. I knew what university and the course I was going to go after in, in, in college for the undergrad. And very early on, I knew I wanted to do a PhD. I, I knew I wanted to be a subject matter expert in specifically what's called aerodynamics or fluid dynamics, but how airflow moves on surfaces of an airplane like a wing or within a jet engine or th those kind of things. So I very clearly knew very early on exactly what did I want to do, and I went after it. Um, and I was very lucky because most of my friends, I would say almost all of my friends that I can think of, had no idea what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. They were probably put down a path of a generic business degree or a generic accounting uh, certificate or a generic science degree that was so broad, it didn't really give them access into the particular thing they might be very keen on doing. And I realized very young, I was very lucky that I had that for some reason, that I just, I knew it and I went after it and I did it. and you know, that was a good thing for me. Yeah, I think that is definitely rare. I think a lot of adults, even, you know, in their 30s, 40s or older are still trying to figure out a lot of times what they want to do. So that's really special that at 14, you were like, this is kind of the path. So you go through and you, you like you said, you went through a PhD into this stuff. As you were doing all this kind of education, did it solidify the fact that you were like, yep, this is the type of work I want to do? Or did you kind of start to say, mm, maybe I want to do something a little different from this? It wasn't until I joined the workforce. So I was hired into who I work for now, Bell Labs. So Bell Labs is the research division of a parent company. At that time, it was Lucent Technologies, who you might know uh, from an American historical perspective. And then it became Alcatel Lucent and now it's Nokia, but Bell Labs is the research arm of a parent company. So they hired me and they were creating a new lab in Dublin in Ireland, first lab outside mm -hmm. of North America for Bell Labs. And they were starting this new team in this area called thermal science. So how do you remove heat from hardware and soft, or from hardware and photonics and electronics like uh, computer chips and things like that. So they were looking for people with my skill set, understanding airflow and fluid flow so that you can remove heat very efficiently from this hardware and that helps at reliability and cost of cooling and all that kind of stuff. So I was hired in and that's a, a whole kind of interesting story, the process of that hiring. But when I got in, I was applying my knowledge of airflow in that very academic way, but I was sitting in on a team with other people from academia all over the world, like US and Ireland and elsewhere. And I realized that when we were talking to product engineers in our company, that my colleagues were speaking in equations to them rather than speaking in a way that would actually resonate with those other folks because they're coming at things from a totally different perspective, different training, and they have different needs and they have different constraints on their time. And I found it extremely interesting slash frustrating, frustrating that I was in on these calls and my, my colleagues could not see past their training, could not see or could not interpret the fact that the people on the other end of the call clearly we're not getting what we were trying to sell them. We were trying to sell them new research or new technologies or whatever. So I was very happy doing my hardcore aeronautical, aerodynamics, fluid dynamics work right up to that point. And a few months in when I was in the, in the working in industry and I started realizing there's something, I'm seeing things a very different way to all of my colleagues. I think about communication and I think about collaboration and I think about how I help other people understand the value of what I do when they might not naturally understand that and how do I communicate that to them and very quickly I saw a massive gap uh, certainly in the Bell Labs end of things but then more broadly I realized that very few trained engineers and scientists have that ability to do that kind of broad communication 
And I saw this gap and I saw an opportunity where I believed I could have orders of magnitude more impact with my science training if I was able to myself bridge these communication gaps, these collaboration gaps, but also help others do that. And that was like a light bulb moment for me. That was as clear to me when I experienced that as when I looked up at the planes and I realized I wanted to know how to, to design these, right? I knew in those moments of frustration that, and I felt kind of, I had this weird um, certainty about my approach that I thought that there was a different way, a better way that I could do that myself and that I had the ability to maybe help others embrace that. And therefore they would be individually more impactful and our team would be more impactful and therefore the organization would be more impactful. And that was really a kind of a considerable light bulb moment for me that then totally changed my perspective and the goals I then went after, which were no longer about aeronautics and fluid dynamics. It was about helping people um, overcome some of these inherent barriers and tensions and miscommunications and helping individuals and organizations be all that they can be by embracing this other quote unquote softer side of technology, which I don't like that terminology. That's why I put it in air quotes. I don't think it's right to call it soft. I think it's critically important and even harder to get right than the deep technological side. So that's what drove me. And that has been my passion for quite some time. You know, it's interesting that you say that because I definitely felt uh, similar feelings on, on a slightly different topic. I think one of the challenges is when you're in an organization or you've worked at different places and you're the one saying something different and everyone else might say that makes no sense or you don't know what you're talking about. This is how we've always done it. You're hearing that. But there's like this battle that you have because you're like, wait, no, something is is off. I, I feel it. I want to do it. Did you have any of that? And how did you kind of decide like, no, I need to change what I'm doing because it's that important? Yeah, I, I've I've had that in the past and I have it today in, in different ways. And uh, some of this comes with maturity, but my earliest kind of life hack that I had to apply, and this took a little bit of me teaching myself this ability and continuously reminding myself to not get frustrated by the things, but to actually see it as a challenge. So if I think I'm that great, and if I think I'm such a great communicator, and if I really am that great, why is it that these folks who are smart people don't understand the value of what I'm trying to bring? So you can either take two approaches as you can either say, well, I'm super smart and they're idiots, and I'm not going to waste any more time trying to convince them. Or you can realize that I'm actually not doing a good job convincing them, because if I did a good job, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So I had to really look at it, deeply look at myself, my style of communication, my mode, body language, tone of voice, the words I used. And especially I had to start trying to appreciate the other person's perspective. So this hack, a kind of multiple dimensions of a hack was one, understand that if you're not convincing someone, it's 99.9% .9 probably your issue that you need to fix. And secondly, you need to understand things from their perspective. How are, what are they going through today? What are their issues in their job? What might be going on with them in their personal life? Is, are they bringing a different attitude to this meeting today versus what they might do tomorrow because something has changed? Or is this a real continuous pain point for them? And how do I convey the fact that I understand their pain point and my solution will be the solution to their pain point? And how do I get that across with all of this nuance and complexity that is the human condition? So early on, I spent a lot of time thinking about the other person, thinking about myself, what those inherent tensions would be, and what was the challenge of overcoming that. And I'm kind of largely driven by challenges in life anyway. So once I set for me personally that framework of it becoming, instead of a frustration of becoming a challenge, that's all I needed then to try and switch my brain and give it the right type of energy to really make an effort at doing a better job um, and making those connections between people. Did you study any type of psychology or linguistics or anything else, or is this just kind of just your own life experience that helped you discover this? I, I haven't studied any of those, um, although later in life I've developed a keen interest for them to try and understand better so I can help under, un, other people understand better why I would do things a certain way. It's been helpful to try and uh, formalize some of my learning in that area. But what I would say is, when I, one of the big a big life lesson I had very young, I was playing music in competition, and I'd be I would practice away to myself, you know, listening. And I would play in the competition, and I wouldn't do very well. And I practice some more, just listening by ear, you know, the sound coming out of the violin, the fiddle into your ear, 
and I, I would hear it a certain way and then I'd go into competition, I'd listen to my competitors and I think, I don't understand why they're beating me. I mean, I think I actually sound better and do better things than them. And it wasn't until I invested in a small little tape recorder. So this is going back a while. And it was a tape recorder that you could actually have a speed dial on it. You could dial the speed back and you could listen to technique and stuff. But I started playing into that and listening back to everything I did. And then I realized what I'm hearing directly from my instrument is not actually what others would hear. And I realized that if I was uh, someone other than me listening to what I played, I wouldn't have been that impressed by it at all. And for some reason, from my own perspective, listening to the instrument straight, I guess because I was so comfortable with it, I heard it in a totally different way, heard my technique a different way. And I started realizing when I listened back that if I uh, analyzed this as if I was someone else, not myself, and if I gave myself that ability to hear it from an outside perspective, like taping yourself, that that opened up my mind completely to what my music was lacking. And then I could use that as a way to improve. And then when I went into uh, my PhD and you present in public and then presenting in work, um, I don't do this anymore. Oh, every so often I check it just to make sure I haven't lost touch. But earlier on, I used to do it where if, if I was videoed, I would watch the video and it could be cringeworthy. You know, what am I doing with my hands? How did I flow between different topics? Did I stutter? Did I, you know, people, a lot of people can don't realize it until they listen back to themselves that they say um and ah quite a lot. And, you know, if I was doing that, that would drive me crazy, honestly, right? So I became extremely analytical and uh, particular about what I, how I was presenting myself either musically or otherwise. And I would look back and there's no better way to understand yourself and if you want to improve than to do that. And it can be very tricky it can kind of be very off-putting initially but i think it was for some reason i don't exactly know why whatever way my brain chemistry was but i think that early life lesson of taking an outside perspective and evaluating myself that way i found it changed my entire perspective about how i thought about myself and then i think i just augmented that and amplified that and took that approach to everything i did and that includes thinking about how others might view me i try and almost see myself as a little version of myself or someone else on my shoulder looking at this exchange and what would that person think about Dunal if he said things that way and so on, you know? That, I mean, that's a really interesting take. I've definitely learned a lot from doing podcasting for a long time. And like you said, hearing how I would do things, one of the things I learned from podcasting is in life, when someone's talking, a lot of times we will say, mm, yeah, uh-huh, while they're talking. In podcasting, you can't do it because it's really annoying to the person listening. So yeah. that was like a learned thing. I totally understand what you're saying. Where is the balance, though, or the line drawn between I'm going to adjust this and approve myself versus, no, this is part of who I am and I like this and I'm not going to change it even though these people are not approving of it? Yeah, I, that's... Uh... Very interesting question, and there's no kind of silver bullet answer. I think it comes with maturity, and it comes with maturity comes knowing yourself. And I've I've suffered from that in my early career quite a lot, where people would tell me a certain thing. You know, you shouldn't be quite so honest and quite so blunt with people, and maybe you shouldn't quite voice your opinion exactly like that, and you know, so on and so forth. And then and then other times, I would have a tendency to be very quiet, and I have others that have told me explicitly. If you don't, if I don't start hearing your voice regularly, and in fact, I want to hear your voice to be the first in every meeting, we're going to have an issue because you as a leader need to be heard. And so I've had these continual, we'll say, internal conflicts where it's been requested of me at times that I should act or speak up or do a thing a certain way that would not be inherently natural to me. Now, there's times where I've had to overcome that and again, see it as a challenge. And that's been extremely helpful to me. And there's other times where I felt no, that takes me too far away from who I believe I am as a person, who I'm comfortable with. And then I say, look, the consequences can be what they are. I have to look myself in the mirror. So I think when you're much younger, it's very challenging, very tricky to find that balance. I think what you have to do is look at these things objectively. Try and, try and think about how you view yourself. What are your values? Try and take it from the other person's perspective that often people are actually trying to help you, even though in the moment it might not seem that way look at their feedback objectively and, and just embrace it and think, well, if I do go down this path, how might it make me be better? How far is too far down this path? How can I put some kind of a checks and balances in my own approach so that I don't go too far down because that takes me away from who I am? But how do I maybe go 
far enough that I learn from that and that makes me a better person. And I've I've benefited immensely from different people giving me feedback throughout the years and then me taking all that different feedback and kind of combining it, it, it combining it itself and then combining it with who I think I am, who I should be, and trying to continuously evaluate yourself and try and understand yourself. And if you don't do that, you you can't possibly address that question you've asked, right? You have to look very deep inside first. You have to understand yourself and then you have to be comfortable with yourself. And I'm at the stage now where, you know, there's certain things I do in a certain way that I know might upset people, especially if you don't know me initially, if you're kind of starting to work together. But equally at the same time, I believe I'm a good person and I know if they get to know me, they'll understand, well, Dunal kind of just makes that face because he makes that face or whatever. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm completely comfortable with that now. But earlier... I would have been much more conscious of it. Ah, you know, it's interesting because you have this kind of very analytical view on a lot of parts of your life. Do you think that came from how you were raised or that's just like who you are as a person and kind of developed over the years? I think, uh, I think it was more just inherent in me, you know, whatever way Mm -hmm. my brain chemistry worked out, I think you know, and I think back, and I've often thought about this because, yeah, even my parents and my brothers would say I'm a bit of an anomaly in the family from that point of view. But I remember very young just thinking about everything. I mean, honestly, I'm not even sure I've said this publicly before, but I remember when I was uh, pre-teens and early teens, you know, I remember sitting in bed at night for hours staring at the ceiling trying to contemplate life, existence, the universe. God, religion, what does it all mean? And being immensely confused and overwhelmed by the complexity of those types of thoughts. And no matter how many arguments or debates or reading I did on it, nothing resolved that complexity until eventually I got to some internal personal understanding or reasoning that I was comfortable with. And again, it's back to that thing of knowing yourself and figuring things out for yourself. But eventually I got to the point where I just had to kind of realized that it was getting me nowhere going that deep into these extremely esoteric, complicated things and that you just have to live life and be a good person. But I always I always had that. There was something very inherent or very natural to me to just be kind of hyper analytic. And sometimes it wasn't a good thing. Um, and that's something I've had to kind of uh, fix as well. Yeah, I can relate to that as an overthinker. <laughs> Where you, sometimes it's great because that's part of like, you know, the research you do, you want to learn more. And then sometimes it's, it's not helpful. So I can definitely relate to that piece. Um, so you, like you said, you worked for Bell Labs early on once you finished your PhD. When did you actually move to the U.S. and kind of get into this kind of shift into the type of career stuff you do with the company now? Well, there was always so my initial role was a researcher doing the thermal science work and then i became a technical manager and i was responsible for a team so i grew that team quite substantially in a, in a few years and back to this comment about me observing how other people were kind of doing things in, in a way i would think was non-optimal we'll say and when i started hiring people i immediately gravitated towards hiring people that had phds that was kind of like a thing you had to have to work in bellows that were deeply technical, but had an immense passion to turn the research into product and have impact in the market, and that had a flair for the creative. Every single person I hired either brought that creativity directly into their work in interesting ways, or they had hobbies in crafts and arts outside of work where where they mightn't have brought it necessarily directly explicitly in, but you knew that, that there was that connection in their brain. And I gravitated towards hiring and working with those people, and I found them these kind of hybrid technologists meet creative types. I found them fascinating. I found that all the unique thinking, all the unique ways of solving problems, all of that came to bear with them. And then as a team, as it with a diverse team of these different thinkers and doers, we became very quickly known as the team across the company that could do fundamental research, come up with crazy new ideas, turn it into a product, do all the testing with the products, have it have impact, and then the way we did that was in a very highly experiential UI, UX, even though I didn't know what those things were at the time. But we knew how to make our technology beautiful and we knew how to make people fall in love with it. But we also knew how to make it real such that it could do that translation to the business and product side. So we became known as that. So I kind of had a natural inclination towards working with people and always turning our research and our ideas and our technology into something 
that people wanted to kind of touch and feel and be around and experience without any formal training. It was just a gap I saw and we filled it. Um, then I moved to the States five years ago, September 2015. Continued, I, I won't, it's too long of a story, but I was responsible for various different uh, research teams. Uh, one was an audio visual, so that exposed me to a whole new different type of technology and way of thinking. One was on photonics integration, how you make lasers, and then the team in Ireland and the thermal science. And then while I was in the US, and this was kind of one of these fun coincidences, but one of these things you have to be ready for when it happens. In 2016, just a few months in after I had moved over, it was the 50th anniversary of this famous event called the Nine Evenings of Theatre and Engineering, where Bell Labs engineers worked with the likes of Rauschenberg, Cage, Whitman, Rayner, all the, you know, the biggest names mm -hmm. in art in modern times. And they had these nine evenings of theatre and engineering. So they brought the engineering and science together with the arts. And it was this seminal bringing together that showed the value of this. So 2016, a few months after I moved over, it was the 50th anniversary. And we had been invited to a bunch of events in New York just to meet with artists because of Bell Labs. And honestly, we had institutionally forgot about the role Bell Labs has played always integrating the arts with technology. And we forgot about the role that Bell Labs played in this particular uh, event in 1966. Anyway, we went to these uh, events. I was happy to talk to people. Every single conversation I had with artists that night blew my mind, every single one of them. And then myself and a few others, including the, the president of Bell Labs, a guy called Marcus Weldon, we knew straight away walking away from those conversations that this was a, an element we were completely missing in ourselves, in the way we thought about the world and how we were hiring people and how we were developing our research and how we were, we were thinking about the intersection of research and humanity or technology and humanity. And um, so we knew then straight away, this is something we, we had to do. We had to institute a program to dip our toes back in the water and try and see if we could bring a lot of value to the organization by bringing these worlds together. So just immediately, I, you know, I was the natural fit or I stepped up to it or whatever. I didn't mind the challenge and I seeked that opportunity and ended up leading it in a very informal, low key way with one artist. Went reasonably well. We learned a lot of things started applying that learning to the next few artists. And we just built it up gradually where after a few years, we now have about 20 plus 24 artists, 25 artists that we're supporting all over the US and, and parts of Europe. And it's been quite successful, but it was really, I could give you 10 examples in my career where I was willing to stick my head above the parapet. I was willing to take a significant career risk because I loved the challenge and I saw an opportunity and I saw a gap and I thought, this is helping me be a better person, but also maybe I can help the organization be better if I was to embrace this difference. And that's just one one example. Yeah, I you know, I was watching, um, I think it was a TED talk you did a little while ago, and you were kind of talking about um, you know, the the opposites. You had this this nice image of kind of like a triangle of the difference between how engineers think and how artists think, and then when you come together, it kind of makes this rectangle and how everything works together. Um, which again makes so much sense. And um, you had talked about, uh, you know, people are spending more time on their phone than with the people they love. And as you were just talking about a few minutes ago, your fascination with how you're communicating with people. Again, like, I, you know, it's interesting because uh, I had heard about you from a, an event that we were a part of um, talking about technology. And I am always fascinated by how can we use technology to connect us better as people to the, the people and the things we love most. And you kind of blend this concept and making it more humane, in my opinion. Can you talk about a little bit how Nokia Bell Labs and what you're doing, we've talked about this before, is blending the art and science to help in a larger scale, like why you do these research and experiments and what the implications are for it later on. Yeah, so the the diagram you talked about is my kind of way of describing the big differences between an engineer, a scientist, and an artist. And, and they're very different. Like briefly, we're trained in engineering and science to be very uh, reductive in our approach, very linear and logical. And an artist, by nature or otherwise, is exactly the opposite. They're kind of divergent in their thinking. And from an engineer's perspective, they're nonlinear and illogical. And that's why the two worlds don't mix very well often, because they're so different in the way they communicate, think about the world, think about uh, hum humans' perspective or 
how humans should be centered in that world, in the technological world. So when we started having these conversations, we realized, you know, the, the gap we have in our training as engineers and scientists to the extent that we do not almost ever think about the human. I mean, if you think about that, that's shocking. You might think, well, wait a minute, you tell me the people that designed the iPhone didn't think about the human or the people that invented Facebook didn't think about, no. What, what I mean by that is they think about providing certain utility to a human via this product in the near term. They never think about what might be the downstream negative consequences of this technology on our humanity. So we are trying to embrace this, what we call, or not just us, but lots of people, but this general concept of humanizing technology. And it's to acknowledge the fact that we as humans have evolved a certain way for the entirety of our existence, however many ways you want to count it, 100,000 plus years, right? And only in the last 20 years have we completely disrupted that. We've disrupted that with digital technology, with the web, with online, social media, all this stuff. So we've taken our evolution, which is for 99.9999999% of the time, more nines than I can count. We've operated a certain way uh, with our humanity, like the importance of physical proximity between people, the importance of physical action, and the importance of connecting in smaller, quote unquote, tribes of a certain number, building trust and building community in that way. And we've completely disrupted that where we now can go virtual online, have tens of thousands of friends and never have met one of them. Mm -hmm. And what you have to understand is I'm not saying that's bad, but what's bad is when the technologists develop this technology and these products and they don't think about what might be the downstream negative consequences. So the reason we bring, and there's many reasons, by the way, but one of the big reasons we're working with artists is to help center us and center our thinking so that we're more human centric in our approach. And this is a term that's kind of bandied about quite a lot. And I think people use it a lot and maybe don't realize exactly what it should mean. But in my view, it should mean that we think about the human today and the human in the future, the next five, 10, 15 years. And we think about our algorithm or our product or our wearable or our smartphone or our whatever. And we think, how might that be manipulated either naturally or otherwise in a way that could be very negative for humanity and two prime examples in recent time are is the pandemic of digital loneliness which yeah. is um, kind of scary when you le read the numbers and you realize what's going on and then we of course have this issue with uh, fake news those two things alone i believe trace back to the convergence of mobile technology like 4g lte um, and online social media platforms which were then enabled by that connectivity so think about those two major issues in modern humanity that have come about only because of the convergence of those two technologies I mentioned. And now start thinking in 10 years time when 10 emerging technologies collide, what, what might happen to our humanity? Who's thinking about that? Who in the engineering science community, who in these companies are contemplating that negative effect? I can tell you none of them are because they're obsessed with next quarter's revenues and next product release. And they're not thinking about those downstream effects. So that's what we're thinking about. And that's our role as Bell Labs. And don't get me wrong, we're very privileged that we can do that because we're a research institute who has always uh, looked at technology this way. And we're looking at it the same way today. And we're giving the time and the latitude to be able to think 5, 10, 15 years out. But I would argue that those other big organizations that are making a lot of money in modern times should be investing in this type of thinking because otherwise you don't you can't understand the harm that can be done to humanity if you don't even contemplate if you don't even ask the question up front and i think that the first step should be people just asking the question and then you can start thinking about your products and your revenue and market forces but you're in real trouble if you don't even ask the question and that's where one of the big important areas of bringing an artist into these organizations is critical because they ask those questions all the time they're always probing what about the human what about the future what about the past how can we learn from the past and all these kind of things. And that's just one example of the benefits of bringing an artist in. Yeah, I think that's why I really do love your work. Not only is it creative and interesting, but how it's bringing people together. And I actually, one of the ones that you all did, I think it was at South by Southwest last year, the blooming one. Mm -hmm. And um, basically, for those that haven't seen it, 
Uh, it was technology coming together and the artist had created this kind of cherry blossom. It was a tree that was gray and you would come in and you would step on these different dots. And if you connected with people by hands or by hugging, different things would happen to the image. It would bring it life and color and connectivity. And then the second you stopped, it disappeared. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's such a, an interesting and cool way to showcase why we need to connect and the value of that. Was there in that particular experiment, I mean, do you have any feedback or kind of what your, uh, what kind of you added to that or why that's important to technology maybe in the long run as well? Yeah, so Lisa Park was the artist um, with that project. And we we worked with Lisa because she had previously worked with a lot of, um, we'll say, sensorizing people. So in other words, putting sensors on people, putting those people in social circumstances and then making visible the invisible signals, the social interactions between those people. And she did it in different ways of measuring brain waves and all that. It's very interesting. And the way she thinks about human connection and making visible those invisible connections was very much aligned with our research direction. So we worked with Lisa. And with Lisa, we asked her very early on, we want to have work with you to understand better haptics. In other words, how do you simulate touch between people but in a mechanized way so mm. the way most people are looking at haptics and by the way haptics is you know when you touch your phone and your phone is making different vibrations that's a type of haptics right but people believe that haptics are critically important in vr because you want to simulate that extra sensory perception of touch and there's a strong belief and i believe it that if you don't try and bring in what are called these chains of persuasion whether it's spatial audio 360 sound or touch your brain's always going to fight the virtual reality. Your brain knows it's not real. Your brain gets upset with you to try and force it to be part of this unreal situation. But you can kind of trick the brain in, in simple ways if you bring in other sensory input like touch via haptics or like spatial audio, moving sound around your head 360. So we're very interested to work with Lisa to understand better um, haptics and the importance of touch in the human condition and her perspective as an artist. And then as a counterpoint, you know, we would share with Lisa the technological approach, which are these extremely clunky, like roboticized haptic gloves. So what happens is if you've seen the pictures and you might have seen mm -hmm. from one of my talks, you have people wearing these gigantic VR goggles and then they're wearing these gigantic clunky haptic uh, gloves. And you're expected as a human being to walk around life as a digital zombie experience in the virtual world through these extremely clunky, weird technologies. So we want to Lisa to explore that and the counter um future to that which we think is kind of techno dystopian i don't believe in that approach at all but maybe the technology will get there the interesting thing with lisa was with with her approach and this was the big learning for us we could integrate technology but in a very hidden kind of calm way so like you mentioned you walk into the space there are these circular pads on the ground and you're not told what to do you don't have to put on any clunky wearable no vr goggles you stand in there, but when you physically make contact with someone, it can be a handshake, a put your hand on their back, a hug or a kiss, whatever. Those sensors in the ground measure how the change in certain parameters in your body happens, and that relates to changes in the cherry blossom. And we had people go through that space, people we never met, never met each other, people we didn't know, complete strangers, and they broke down crying. We had you know, parents with kids and other couples that have been together for 30 years, and they've said to us, that there was something extremely moving in the fact that they had to physically come together to actuate this piece of art. And that helped me understand a couple of things. One, the absolute power of art when it's done the right way to move people and connect people, but also the, the big gap in the way technologists and researchers and developers think about technology. We constantly think, how can we replicate the physical, the human condition with some digital technology? How can we replace it? And I've come to learn through artists is that I think that's actually the wrong question entirely. The question is, how do we understand what's most unique about our humanity? And if we are to use technology, and I'm not advocating not using technology, obviously, because I'm a technologist and I love technology. But if we are to use technology, how do we design that technology with the understanding of what it is that makes us human? And how do we develop, develop frameworks for us to communicate over that technology such that they're not counter to our humanity or such that they don't try and force us down a path that changes our humanity. And that's the kind of way of thinking that I've been exposed to or that working with the likes of Lisa and others, 
because of the very different way they have thought about technology and the intersection of technology and humanity, that's opened up my mind to an entirely new dimension in how I think about technology and humanity, which is super interesting. I love it. Uh, I get so excited because I completely agree. And I think you're right. I always talk about bringing diversity of thought together. You know, if we're just bringing engineers together and, you know, we've talked about in voice technology, for example, and we're not bringing psychologists or you know, sociologists or artists in, we're missing a huge part of the conversation. So I love that your organization is continuing to do that. Is there one uh, experiment that you've done that really stands out to you, if it's not that one, that was really memorable or that you think really showcased the value of human connection within the scope of technology? We, we've done a lot of work and, and not a lot of this is public yet. Some of it is still in the research phases, but we've released some of it. We've, we have an ensemble, a musical ensemble in residence called International Contemporary Ensemble, who are mainly based out of Brooklyn, but they play all over the US. And they're a bunch of super smart musicians. And a lot of them have deep technological backgrounds as well by chance. So they're like the ideal kind of collaborator for us. So, and we have a number of other artists that we've worked with like Seth Cluett and Lainey Pfefferman. And, these folks like are professors at Stevens Institute in Avokan and Columbia, and they do that art and tech fusion just naturally, right? So they're ideal collaborators for us. So for me, some of the most interesting recent work we've been doing is looking at the world through the lens of music, composition, and performance, and thinking about what are the things that are most unique and special about musical like an ensemble and musicians coming together and how they communicate and how they get in the flow state and how they um, interpret the score from the composer and how they might interact with the conductor and all these kind of things so taking that as a, a microcosm but one that's kind of at the extreme right that's very difficult to codify in words and then learning from those relationships and exchanges learning how things are done today with technology or not and how technology might augment or enhance that and then start taking those learnings through a musical lens and start applying it to something like this conversation, which is between two people over a video call. And the likes of, I would say we've only started the research really, we've lots of experiments, but these interactions have helped me profoundly in how I, again, think about and even ask questions. So for example, you know, I've gone deep down this path of questioning. If you, if you and I are together in Jersey City, we're having a coffee, right, across a, a a coffee table in the cafe on this video call if we were in person i can see and hear you just as well right i can see your body language tone of voice facial expressions all of that in person now i can see exactly all that same information here across the video call but there's no way you could argue with me that this even comes close to replicating the experience of two people in physical proximity right yeah so i think about that a lot what is missing in this exchange because the zeros and the ones are the same. So there's this kind of unquantified communication field between people in physical proximity. And if I was to speak in a really geeky engineering way, I see it like it's an inverse square law, just the same as gravity. If I get too close to you, it's uncomfortable. If I step back just a little bit farther, all of a sudden the interaction drops off a map. And I do this um, very simple demo with people if we're in person where we might be sitting at a comfortable distance away and i'll just double my distance and i'll ask you how did that change how you felt about the interaction and everyone says yeah it's completely it's like it's dropped off a cliff so i'm very interested in the fact that this technology has kind of increased the distance between us to infinity from a human connection human emotion point of view now the question is Technologists will say, well, let's just measure everything, let's sensorize everything in the physical, and let me just transport all of myself into your brain, right? And then we can have this call mediated by technology at a distance, and you'll sense me and know me, and I'll sense you and know you and whatever. That's the very kind of technological approach to it. Just measure everything, quantify everything, send it. I don't think it's uh, like that at all. I'm not sure we'll ever get there. I think there's there's aspects in encoded in our DNA and our evolution that make it critically important that we are together in proximity, right? Yes. So, and when if we if I try and fake that by sending your brain information from my brain, just like VR, your brain knows this is this is fake. This is real. It's not going to. It's going to fight it all the time. So, what I believe we have to do is understand that we are now on a different communication paradigm in a way, but we are applying how we would communicate in person 
to how we communicate over a video call. And the way I learned this was I was part of a, a team meeting every Friday morning in New Jersey when I lived there. Um, and I would be in that team with like 15 people at a table and I could tell when someone wanted to talk, when they were going to stop talking, if someone was getting irritated, when the big boss was going to talk, when he might not, when might it be good for me to speak, when not, and so on, right? And then I started working remotely when I moved location and I was diving into those calls. And now all of that was gone. Now I completely lost the ability to interact with those people. I couldn't tell. I had none of those cues, none of those hidden and side channels in what's critical to our humanity. So the question is, do I try and replicate our, uh, the way we are in physical proximity exactly and replicate it by technology and transplant this information to your brain? Or do I acknowledge that this technological approach is different and maybe we should have a different approach on the technology, not to pretend that it's the same as we're in person and not try and replicate it fully. And you get into all these conversations about the uncanny valley and these kind of concepts, if you ever heard of that, which are super interesting. But I think enough technologists are not asking these questions at all. They, they just think, let's make video calls better. Let's go from 2K to 4K to 8K. <laughs> yeah. Let's just improve the quality of the microphone. Uh, that is, for me, it's completely the wrong question. It's the wrong direction. I think you're, you're just adding to the problem in a way, and you're missing out on the fact that you have to remember we are humans after all, and there are certain aspects of our humanity that is never going to go away or not anytime soon. And if you're not addressing or designing or building for that, then you're either going to cause issues or you're losing opportunity. Yeah, I could not agree more. Uh, as I said to you and said to others, I've been a dancer my whole life. And um, a perfect example is we'll just do online classes. It's not it's not the same. It's just not. <laughs> and it, part of dance is communal. It's, it's being around other people. And there's a different feeling than when you're just watching a video uh, either live or not. So I totally understand what you're saying. And, and I think about that as well. How do we translate offline events into online events? As a dancer, I've always thought about uh, all my work that I've done is breaking the fourth wall. I've always hated how there was, you know, the performers and the audience. And I was like, why can't we interact? And when I ever what I would do that, you know, they would create some really cool human connection. Um, so I love that you're you're thinking about that. For people that are, are watching or listening, if they're like, this is really interesting. I didn't get a PhD in engineering. How, do you have any advice of how they could get into this type of work where it's kind of mixing of art and tech or research? Do you have any advice for that? Yeah, I think there's lots of ways. And, and, and a PhD has nothing to do with it. That's just by chance, you know, a uh, passion I had and something I went after. And in fact, mo a lot of the best people that I know in this world that are these hybrids don't have a PhD. And I think a PhD might have held them back even from being as good as they are. So there's this kind of newer emerging role called a creative technologist. And um, that can be someone that is generally they're kind of good at coding in some form or the other. They might have done it as an undergraduate in college, or they might have just taken it up as their own hobby, but they're, they're pretty good at that. You know, they can look at all the different uh, languages and they can build things in unity, but they also then have this creative flair. So a lot of the folks that I know that are really good creative technologists have some kind of a formal or they're very good at uh, software development type uh, computer coding work and then they might be kind of into music or they have some other arts hobby and and then they're very creative and they kind of magically bring these two worlds together and they're the ones i believe the people that are going to be most impactful in the next 20 years are folks that might be described generically as a creative technologist so if you have if you're handy with building like maker um, hacker type technology, whether it's with Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, and if you can code, and if you are thinking, well, I've got this good technological capability, but now how do I go beyond that? How do I differentiate myself from not being just like everyone else that can do something with a Raspberry Pi? Then you have to start really expanding your horizons, exposing your brain to all of these different perspectives, different ways of thinking, different ways of doing. And for me, the greatest exposure I've ever had has been with the artistic community, because every single artist I meet and every conversation I have with them seems to open up my mind to a totally different perspective. And my brain has been rewired now to start seeing the world in a different way and think about things in a different way because of that exposure. So if, you're, if you've gone through tech training of one form or the other, or you're deep into tech, but you would like to um, broach into this kind of creative world, you must, must, must expose yourself to as much as possible all of those different ways of thinking and doing 
and expose yourself to the art world, but not not the generic art world. If you're into tech, it should be the multimedia, new media, use of emerging technology with the creative artistic practice type of work. And, and that will give you an exposure to how you might go beyond how you think technology can be used today. Yeah, I, I'm i always a fan too when uh, the creatives are given a chance to shine. I think a lot of times it's always pushed in school STEM. Now they have STEAM, um, but that, you know, you should be doing science, technology, go to the math school, go to this. And yet it's the creatives, as you said, that kind of ask the different questions, the questions that need to be asked to help advance some of these technologies. So I am always excited when we hear that. If people want to connect with you or they want to learn more about the work you're doing, where is the best place to do that? They can find out about the program more generally if they just Google search Bell Labs EAT. EAT stands for Experiments in Art and Technology. That's the name of our program. So you can find our website there. Um, to find out more about the work, I regularly update on any exhibits we have on my uh, different social media platforms. So LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. Just Google search my name. You can find me there. If people want to go a little bit farther and have a conversation beyond what they hear here, then LinkedIn. Connect with me on LinkedIn, send a message. Uh, happy to have a chat and I can certainly share ideas for anyone that's interested in career progression and what might be the next, the first good step for you to get into this kind of world, depending on your background. Yeah, and the last question I like to ask all of my guests, Dunal, is what is one word or quote or mantra that you try to live by every single day? Uh, so definitely the kind of mantra would be taking the perspective of on your taking your last breath on your deathbed retrospective to help you with your decisions today <laughs> right so in other <laughs> words i project forward if i have to make a decision about anything if i was on my death deathbed and i know my life is coming to an end and i've taken my last few breaths would i think back on a decision that i didn't take and regret it or would i think back on it and say happily yes i'm glad i took that on, even if it didn't go the way I thought, but in that moment for the right reasons, I did that. And that's my kind of view. So no matter what it is in life, I always try and predict, would I feel bad about this decision in the future or would I feel good? And would I feel bad or good in a time when it really matters? And uh, a lot of the work I do today is driven by that kind of approach. I mean, if I, life is short and if I have skills to offer and if I can help, be, help people be better in certain ways, then that's the most I can do right within my life. And when I'm on my deathbed, hopefully I'll look back and be proud of the decisions I made. So yeah, that's my mantra. I love it. Well, thank you so much uh, for being here and for all the great work that you do. And I am excited to hear more. And again, if you're watching and listening, definitely check out all the work Nokia Bell Labs is doing. It's pretty amazing and interesting stuff. So thank you, Juno. I appreciate it. Thank you. Great to chat.